my interest in the, in the beginning was very much in the question of palliative care, and, and I see uh, so, someone who I called them this morning, West Island Royalty, but my friends Teresa Deller and Rose DeAngelis, who are here from the West Island Palliative Care Center, but it's something that's very close to my heart. Uh, with my former colleague Russ Williams, we were very involved in getting the West Island Palliative Care Center off the ground about 15 years ago. Um, at that point, it was very much a professional interest. Uh, like anything else, you hope it's a, an insurance policy that you never have to lose, but it became very quickly a personal issue because first my mother and then my father passed away in the same room of the palliative care residence. So the whole palliative care movement and the whole question of enriching the choices that we have for palliative care in our society was one of the original motivations for me. But obviously we want to look at a broader uh, uh, series of issues, so that's what brought me um, forward into this, uh, this debate. And as I say, I got to chair the committee from December 2009 until um, February 2011. So it was a very exciting time. I'll give you a bit of a flavor of what we did over that time, um, and then carry you through the following steps. It gets a bit complicated, but I'll be here to answer all your questions at the end, so let me give this a shot. Um, in the fall of 2009, the Collège des Médecins um, published a study on the whole question of uh, end of life, and this is from the Collège des Médecins, this idea of medically assisted death. Because the Collège des Médecins said at the end of life, there are a lot of gray zones and gray issues that they turn to the legislator to clarify um, what doctors can or cannot do, what is the proper use of uh, sedation, what is the proper use of certain medications that were being given. Um, there was already in the law the notion that patients can refuse treatment, and how far does that refusal of treatment go in terms of the choices that patients can make who are, who are terminally ill. So they had a hot potato, I guess, and they said, well, we'll pass the hot potato along to the politicians, and gave us the challenge to try to come up with a response to the concerns that the Collège des Médecins had raised. So we decided to go on a, a two-phased approach. First, we had a, in the spring of, winter and spring of 2010, we met, I think it was about 32 experts drawn from the medical world, drawn from the legal world, drawn from the, the world of ethics, uh, community groups, senior representatives, and said, we want to go out and ask the population questions about end-of-life choices, about the question of dying with dignity, how should we go about it? So it was a very interesting conversation that the people that we would have expected, the, 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 the doctors' federations, the Quebec Bar Association, uh, many ethicists, uh, including Margaret Somerville from uh, McGill University came and gave us advice on how to undertake this debate with the population. So it was a very interesting discussion, uh, not an easy discussion for sure, because quite clearly on some of the issues uh, th there's no controversy about palliative care, for example. The controversy is more how do we get more of it or how can we fund it more, uh, more effectively, but there's not a debate. No one came to say we're against palliative care, for example. But questions about end of life and should people have a say in whether they want to end their life or not, those were obviously much more controversial. So how to raise those questions with citizens, how to approach those questions that are uh, morally and emotionally charged was a, was a very difficult challenge, but it was something that we thought had to be done because the debate kept coming back to the forefront, not just in Quebec, but as I say, in many countries across the Western world. So the second stage is we and it's always good for us in politics, we got out of the National Assembly and we held hearings here in Quebec, in Montreal, we went to Gatineau, we went to St. Jerome, we went to Sherbrooke, we went to Trois-Rivières, we went to Saguenay, we went to Rimouski. So it was a big challenge in the fall of 2010 and in the spring of 2011 to go out and meet with groups and hear their concerns. And what was interesting is we had, we listened to over 300 witnesses and about a hundred were organizations, and, and there, there are people here who have participated in parliamentary hearings. I see Martin Murphy in the back, for example, and they know the routine, and often they're held in Quebec City, and you have a brief, and you <coughs> speak for 15 minutes, and then you have about a 45-minute exchange with, but not everyone's used to it. So what was exciting about this hearing was two-thirds, 200 of the witnesses, were individual citizens, people who just came, who shared with us their often... Um, 
either very personal, very direct um, personal experiences with death of a loved one in their family and uh, some very tragic stories, some very difficult stories that told us that end-of-life issues were not always managed well and uh, amongst other things taught me the importance of grieving because I remember one day we were in Saguenay and a woman came and uh, you know, set up a picture of her mother and um, lit a candle and with great tears and great emotion explained the death of her mother 15 years ago and, and I just thought wow you know, 15 years later, it is still such a hurt, such emotion. Her mother died a terrible and painful death, lingering on for many months, asking over and over again uh, for the right to die, the right to put an end to her suffering. So there were testimonies like that, which were heart-wrenching. Equally, there were people who came before us to testify against the notion of uh, medically assisted death, who, who spoke equally with great fears and great emotions from great a sense of the sanctity of life. So the, witness, the hearings we went through, what we heard was, was very difficult, as I say, and, and sharing it all uh, uh, a little bit like Dennis. I had the job of trying to keep people on schedule, but when someone's there talking to you about the death of their loved one, it's kind of hard to cut them off, you know, so turn the microphone off and we'll move on to the next witness. So my, my, the, the members of the committee were very tolerant towards me because we knew every day what time the day would start, but we never knew what time the day would end. And uh, it, it was a very, as I say, very rich, but a very moving experience as we moved across the province and, and talked about these issues. In addition, we had a session at the end of every uh, uh, day, which was an open microphone, where people in the crowd just came up and, and shared their experiences as well. And you just saw that um, many, many observations came forward on both sides of the question. As I say, uh, I don't want to underestimate the importance of palliative care in my words, but it was less controversial. But wherever we went, we met with people who either have founded palliative care residences or offer palliative care services in, um, in hospitals and other places. So they gave us their vision of the importance of palliative care. Um, but more of the controversy and more of the media interest, of course, was on the question of whether we should uh, liberalize, if you will, legislation around the end of life. So, um, uh, how can I divide up uh, the many, many things that we heard? Uh, one of the things that did strike me from, the two things struck me from the palliative care movement was, first, a very serious opposition to the notion of medically assisted death. Most of the palliative care doctors and others who came forward uh, were fearful of it. They thought that it would deflect attention away from palliative care. So there was a great concern there. But the other thing that many of the doctors said, which alarmed me quite a, deal, a bit, was uh, many of the palliative care doctors said that many of the treatments that patients receive at the end of their life, and this was their word, not mine, were useless. And when you think of the suffering that you go through for another <coughs> surgery, another this or another that, um, there's a bestseller right now in the New York Times uh, uh, called Being Mortal by Aral Gawande, which is, if you haven't had a chance to read it, it's a very readable book, but it does remind us of the limits of treatment, and uh, doctors and our medical science likes to believe that we, if we work hard enough, and if people's willpower and determination is great enough, we can overcome any illness and every sickness, and, and that's not true. And, and what surprised me in a lot of the testimony was uh, uh, doctors who would tell us that uh, many, many of the treatments that were tried at end of life added to suffering and had no medical outcome. So it was, a, it was quite a stark kind of statement that we got from the palliative care world, palliative care doctors in particular. So that was one of the reflections that we had. As I said, we had many very sad testimonies from not only cancer patients, because we tend to think often of this question in terms of uh, cancer, but people with various degenerative diseases. There was one um, particularly uh, uh, poignant testimony by someone named Gislain de Blanc, who used to be a senior civil servant in Quebec City. He was the deputy minister of agriculture, among other things. Very eloquent, very uh, well-spoken man, who has one of the, I can't remember the name of it, but one of those very rare, but terrible degenerative disorders. I think he's now lost 80% of the control over his muscles. He's confined to a wheelchair. 
And he said to the committee, you know, I'm very lucky. I have a loving wife and two daughters. They look after me. He had the means to adapt his home. So in terms of bathtubs, in terms of all that you can do to have someone whose mobility is so restricted, um, he's been able to afford the most comfort possible in his condition. But he's someone who's become very much an advocate for when it becomes intolerable for him because the kind of death that you would have when you have his condition is a very gradual, very painful, very uh, disruptive death. He said, I want to have the choice. I would like to be able to determine when I can no longer go on, that I've had enough of this, um, to be able to put an end to my life. And it was, as I say, all through the, the testimonies, I thought very much of his testimony in the very eloquent way that he asked his questions. We also heard stories, I think it was a family in Val d'Or, where uh, again, someone else with a degenerative disease uh, um, wanted to end his life before he became too much of a burden on his family, so you know, he went out in the backyard in his wheelchair with a shotgun, and it was uh, an unsu well, at first an unsuccessful attempt, so you had to rush him to the hospital, he wasn't dead yet, and then what kind of measures do you do to treat this person who's tried to kill himself because he's dying? It, it got very complicated. Um, but there were very sad stories like this that we heard over and over again about people who had had a very uncomfortable uh, end of their life and had a very difficult, to, who felt they didn't have choices, I guess, and they, they, they testified. On the other hand, and very eloquently as well, um, people who came from the other side of the question, that this is opening a Pandora's box, that this would be a slippery slope towards abuse that you can't, you can't manage, you can, cannot control, the question of end of life and that uh, for many considerations that uh, people would put pressure on their elderly loved ones to put an end to it because uh, the suffering had gone on long enough or maybe they had other kinds of interests. Uh, people would accuse the government of encouraging people to put an end to their life instead of providing them adequate palliative care. So there were debates like that and more important debates of people who came at this question from religious or ethical, moral considerations that, that life is sacred and it's really not for us to make these kinds of decisions. It's really up to uh, nature to take its course and uh, that doctors are under the Hippocratic Oath to, to do all that they can to help provide comfort and to try to find a, uh, they try to find a ease the, the suffering for someone till the end of their days. So it was very clearly there were two, two uh, Two arguments that came forward. We, we tried not to be, you know, influenced. Lots of people came with polling data one way or another. Lots of people came with uh, uh, anecdotal stories about what goes on in other countries. Those the committee took more seriously. I had to leave the committee in 2011 because I had the good fortune to be named Minister of Native Affairs, which is something else that I care about a great deal. So you, you couldn't do both. So I had to leave the committee in 2011 at the end of the public phase. But then the work carried on, and the next phase, I think, was a very important one. Um, committee members went to France and Belgium, which were two countries that have had a long debate over this question. France decided against uh, a euthanasia or a medically assisted death. Belgium decided for. Both were cited in abundance before the committee, so people went and met parliamentarians, met doctors, met opposition, and then people on both sides of the question in those countries to enrich it. And then the committee members sat down and I think in a, something like 45 meetings um, were able to draft a unanimous report that they presented to the National Assembly. And if you look back at the report, the, the first section, the longest section, deals with enriching um, the offer for palliative care in Quebec. And I think this still remains one of the most important uh, recommendations because access to palliative care is very uneven. The ideal ratio, it would be one bed for 10,000 population, and that is what's felt is needed. And parts of Quebec are there, other parts of Quebec are not there. I was uh, proud to be with Teresa Deller and her team uh, when we expanded the West Island Palliative Care Centre from 9 to 23 beds. So it's, I think, still the, the largest hospice in Canada. Am I right, Teresa? Thank you. And. Um, and that is the, the right ratio, but I know because my daughter is a volunteer there and then talking to Teresa and her team, um, they're never short of patience, sadly. It's still something that there's a great need for in our society. 
So that was one of the recommendations. The second was to come up with a better framework for, well, we sort of call them living wills or medical, and this is my intention. How far do you want doctors to go? That you make a decision today, so not when you're, you're, you're terminally ill, but you, you give instructions, these can be signed, these can be notarized, uh, the government will come up with a registry, so that how far do you want doctors to go when you get into very difficult end-of-life choices and end-of-life situations. So this was the second uh, recommendation, was that we need a much better system to, uh, there's the gin arrives, that's good. <laughs> We need a, a much better uh, system to, to have those sort of uh, intentions or what to, instructions you'd like to give to doctors and people who are treating you at the end of life. And the third was the, the recommendation that there be a liberalization, that this notion of a medically assisted death be included in the options that doctors could provide to their patients. That when, and I'll get to the criteria in a minute. But those are the three broad recommendations of the committee that went to the National Assembly. Now, because we're in politics, every once in a while we have elections, as you know. So we had an election in 2012. Our government was defeated, and it became the task of the, the Pauline Marois government and its minister, Veronique Yvon, to present legislation to the National Assembly. I believe it was in the fall of 2012, so or the spring of 2013. So this became Bill 52, which you see on the, the title for the conference today. And once again, this was a legislation that uh, was extensively studied by the National Assembly. I think more than 50 more witnesses were called to go over the legislation. There were issues about um, whether it is in the jurisdiction of a province to make this sort of decision, or whether it's something that touches the criminal code. Um, there were divergence of opinions, but uh, the, the Minister of Justice, before we lost the election in 2012, Jean-Marc Fournier, had uh, named three legal experts to look at the recommendation, headed by Jean-Pierre Menard, who's one of the, the experts in the whole question of uh, uh, medical law in Quebec. And they came back with a, I'll admit I haven't read the whole thing, is it something like 400 pages, <coughs> report that said that indeed this falls within the jurisdiction of the province and that the province would be legitimate in its, its efforts to liberalize uh, and give a certain legal status to the notion of a, a medically assisted death. So that legislation went forward um, and because it's Quebec and we like politics, we had another election in uh, 2014, about a year ago, and the parts of Quebec government was defeated. So the legislation was brought back to the National Assembly and was adopted finally in June 2014. It was, uh, for the first time in my life, in 20 years in the National Assembly, uh, what we call a free vote, or there was no party line adopted by our party, so our caucus split, uh, I think it was something like 42 voted for and 26 voted against, or 25 voted against it, but overall the vote was 87-26 for Bill 52. And um, as I say, it's very important, very complex legislation, I won't go through the whole part of it, but once again, the key elements of it deal with palliative care, uh, and uh, as I say, because that's less controversial, I haven't talked about it as much, but the palliative care comes how we can increase either palliative care within our hospitals and other health institutes, freestanding palliative care residences such as the one on the West Island, or palliative care at home, those were the three uh, areas where we're trying to develop um, more palliative care. Secondly, there will be a registry kept and there will be a collection of these, uh, I use the expression living wills, that's not the exact translation, but les directives médicaux anticipées in French, so really what you're thinking about the kind of care choices you'd like to have made for you, the treatments you would like or not like to receive at end of life, so there'll be a more formal framework for it. And then thirdly, um, and uh, I'll read it out, um, patients who meet the following criteria may obtain medical aid in dying. So first, it's our legal jargon, to be an insured person within the meaning of the Health Insurance Act, so you have to be a Quebec resident. Secondly, you have to be a full age and capable of giving consent to care. So, I have to be over 18. There have been questions, long questions, about the treatment of young people, so the young people are not eligible for this. And there has to be a clear consent to care. 
You have to be at the end of life. Now that criteria had a long debate in party, parliamentary committee because it's not clear cut that you one day are not an end of life, the next day that you are an end of life. But efforts to try to make a clearer definition were very difficult, so it was left that way. You have to be suffering from a serious and incurable illness. You have to be in an advanced state of irre irre irreversible decline in capability. And you have to experience constant and unbearable physical or psychological suffering, which cannot be relieved in the manner the patient deems tolerable. And this is again, again cited from the legislation. The patient must request medical aid in dying themselves in a free and informed manner by means of the form prescribed by the minister. The form must be dated and signed by the patient. The form must be signed in the presence and of and countersigned by a health or social services professional. If the professional is not an attending physician, the signed form must be given by the professional to the attending physician. So those are the broad outlines uh, of the legislation as it was adopted. So as I say, it's a clear consent, so you have to be someone who is able to give consent. So people who raise concerns before the committee about people, for example, who suffer from Alzheimer's or people who are no longer able to clear, give clear consent are clearly excluded from the legislation. It has to be someone who can make up their own mind, someone who can give clear consent it has to be seen by at least two medical professionals and um, you have to be over 18 years of age, you have to be terminally ill, and you have to be in uh, a physical or psychological suffering uh, which cannot be relieved in the manner that the patient deems tolerable. So that was the legislation that was, that was adopted last June and the legislation gave the, this government until the end of 2015 to develop the guidelines and develop the directives that will follow from that, so to go out. Another important addition in the amendments of uh, the debate over 50, Bill 52 was to protect all medical professionals' right to opt out. So no one will be forced to do this if you're a doctor, if for whatever reason, you, uh, for moral or ethical grounds or any other grounds, you do not want to participate in a medically assisted death, you can opt out. Uh, an institution such as the Palliative Care Centre can opt out. It does not have to, it's not a required service, if you will. So there was an effort to try to protect choices, protect individual stands on this. And perhaps in closing, because it really is something I'd like to hear from you, uh, I can talk more and more, but it, it goes back to the, as I say, the testimony of Gislaine Leblanc, which, which really affected many of us because he said, I don't want to impose my choice on anybody else, but um, this is something that I want for me, for an individual choice over what will be a very end and very difficult uh, death that he will experience one day to have a measure of control over his destiny. And that was something we heard over and over again across the province about situating this in a, in a, in a context of individual choice, a uh, context of uh, individual's rights and I don't want to tell you what to do, but you don't tell me what to do. It's a little bit of the argument if I want to simplify it. So it was something that we heard over and over again across the province. And um, it's something I think that is reflected in the, in the legislation that, that came forward. Um, ironically, uh, I think three months after the legislation was adopted, there had been questions about the, the federal responsibility in the criminal code that I mentioned, but the Supreme Court decision in the Carter case in September of 2014 ruled unanimously um, against the provisions of the criminal code that uh, outlaw assisting someone to commit suicide because committing suicide is not a crime but helping someone to commit suicide it was a crime um, and that was at the heart of the Sue Rodriguez case and then uh, another woman named Mrs. Taylor in British Columbia wanted because the argument was as also it may sound, it was a way to prolong life because otherwise uh, people who were somewhat incapacitated would commit suicide while they still could, but if you waited too long, these were people who suffered from degenerative diseases, someone would have to help you and that person would be exposed to, to, to criminal charges. So that was the heart of the Carter and Rodriguez cases and the Supreme Court ruled 9 nothing against uh, the provisions in the criminal code, so they were struck down. 
But an important passage in the judgment as well, um, the court added that this does fall within provincial jurisdiction. So without mentioning the Quebec case, the Quebec legislation specifically, it did say that it does fall within the province's purview to make legislation because it is part of a continuum of medical services. So that was an interesting decision which I think gave some uh, validation to the choice that the Quebec National Assembly had taken to make this a citizen's debate, to go out and have citizens talk about it. It's not easy and as I say, having listened to all the 300 testimony, it's a very emotional question. It gets us in our, our most heartfelt and, and deepest beliefs uh, and there is profound disagreement in our society. So. It, it was not an easy debate, and I'm sure in this room we have a diversity of opinions as well. Just if I could just conclude, it, it was still, however difficult it was, and I still think of many of those testimonies today. As a parliamentarian, it was a, it was a very good process, it was a very rich process. Um, the parliamentarians who were involved sacrificed uh, uh, many days when they should have been in their ridings, but they were in the whiskey or somewhere else. But uh, I, I think. It was an example of parliamentarians working together as opposed to the question period sort of we're all calling each other names and throwing mud at each other. And I think it was good for our parliamentary process. You may not all agree with the, the end product, but I think in terms of a process, uh, it was very good. It reflected well on the National Assembly and I saw on the federal level to answer the Supreme Court decision, they're suggesting a citizens committee. So I think we maybe uh, anticipated that by about five years. So.